The topic this morning is The Lives of Man and it's actually the title of a book by uh, a very famous Yemeni scholar named uh, Sheikh Abdullah al-Haddad. It's available through Killian Press and a lot of what I'm going to cover is actually f derived from that book, directly out of that book. But I'm going to do some other things as well. But the uh, the actual topic is this man was uh, a, a brilliant scholar from the Yemen who lived uh, almost about 200 years ago. But the topic is is a is a very old topic in the Islamic tradition. There and there are several books in the history of Islam that deal with this uh, tradition of the lives of man, and uh, the book is is published by uh, Abdul Hakim Winter in England, who does not like the politically correct uh, American English, and so uses man, and I know some people uh, in, in America now don't like having man inclusive of women, but it's interesting that uh, the word, the original word, which is a Germanic word, mensch, uh, means the male and the female. It's the idea of a human being. And the woman is a man with a womb. Right? So the, the, the woman is a man who happens to have something that the man doesn't have, which is a womb. And uh, so, um, having said that, the lives of a human being have been de defined as five according to a Quranic uh, presentation. The, uh, his name is Sheikh Abdullah, A B D A L L A H, Al Haddad, A L H A D D A D. And he uh, was considered a renewer. There's a tradition in Islam that says, every 100 years uh, that God sends somebody who revives or renews this deen, this tradition. And he's considered one of them. He had an extraordinary impact on, um, on Yemen, as well as all over the Muslim world. His books have spread all over. So the five periods, the first period is a pre-worldly period. And the phenomenal existence and noumenal existence in Islam are, there's a dyad here called mulk and malakut. The mulk is what we can see. Anything that you can see, feel, touch, the sensory world. And most of our scholars would include in this uh, what we now know of the unseen phenomenal world, which would be the world of X-rays, light waves, sound waves, gamma rays. This world that we can't see, but it's palpable. We can, we can measure it. We have access to it. The Malakut is a realm that we cannot see. We do not have access to it. There's some interpenetration because the angelic uh, world can move into. The angelic world is in the Malakut and yet they can move into the Mulk. So the Mulk is impacting, uh, the Malakut is impacting the Mulk. And the mulk impacts the malakut in that things that are done in the mulk are either pleasing or disturbing to the malakut. And that has to do with things that are done with the, the moral component. So when people are doing righteous things, the malakut actually is, is happy and rejoices about it. When they do uh, foul things, then the opposite occurs. And, and I'm going to go into that. Now, the, uh, 
The importance of knowing about these according to the Islamic tradition is that unlike uh, 20th century man who in a lot of ways has removed him or herself completely from the unseen experience. If you go into traditional cultures, uh, you know, Weber would call this the, the magical uh, realm, the, the realm of enchantment, the pre-industrial realm that people existed with a sense of magic and they looked at the world uh, because it was not understood they looked at it in a way that caused them to experience an unseen explanation for so much of what was happening around them so weather uh, illness all of these things that happened right now if you look just to take for the example of illness in most cultures illness was often attributed to evil spirits attributed to the evil eye uh, obviously as medicine became more advanced and you can see the Greek attack on this uh, centuries ago I mean you know the Greeks moved into a rat rationalist mode and many of the Greek uh, philosophers did not like those explanations and and they're they're uh, conspicuously absent from a lot of their uh, text, which is interesting given that that was a popular belief in their culture. But if you look at modern uh, man, uh, we have unseen explanations, but they're no longer magical. So bacteria is not something that we see. It's, it's an unseen realm. I mean, you can see it on the microscope, but most people, the doctor says, you've got a virus. It's not something you saw. Right? He doesn't bring out a slide and you know, show you a microscope and there it is. But it is something we understand and people have had biology classes so they do have an idea. So we, we have identified uh, many of the things that are impacting our world and given them material explanations. And those material explanations caused a disenchantment with the world. So we no longer uh, are enchanted by what is around us. Uh, when we look at uh, natural phenomena, many of us have some basic explanations for it. So when weather strikes us, uh, we have scientists that tell us this is El Nino phenomenon. And when drought comes, they explain the reasons for that. And yet in the, in the ancient world, and still in a lot of places on the earth, these things are seen as coming from the unseen world. In other words, drought is still understood in most parts of the world to be uh, from displeasure. So for instance, the Muslims still believe that drought is a sign that blessings have been removed and it's seen as a reminder. And that's why the Muslims will go out and do a rain prayer and they bring their animals out, they bring their children out and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that if uh, a people begin to cheat in their buying and selling and have unjust weights and balances the rain is withheld from them and then he said had it not been for dumb animals they would have gotten no rain at all in other words, it's not the humans that are uh, worthy of the rain, but it's the animals that aren't doing anything wrong. So this is still part of uh, the, the Muslim world, and you will find this also within the Indic culture, within the uh, uh, Scenic culture. You're going to find this uh, in many, many cultures, and certainly amongst uh, traditional Christians uh, in, in uh, American culture, you will still find uh, that many of them when they read the newspaper you know they will see these as signs right what's happened these are signs from God so introducing at an early age the unseen world is introduced to Muslim children and they are made aware of the unseen world and so of the five lives of man only one of them is what we're going to experience in this realm. The other four 
are in another realm. And this is an indication that the majority of creation is actually hidden from us. The Prophet Muhammad said that the likeness of this dunya and the other world is like somebody who puts their finger into an ocean and pulls it out. What is on his finger in relation to the ocean is like the unseen world in relation to this world. And he also reported that he saw the angel Gabriel in his original form. And he filled the entire horizon of a desert landscape. So if you could imagine uh, looking out towards uh, Santa Fe and seeing an angelic being fill the entire horizon, right? Having an experience, that was a, a, a spiritual experience that took place for uh, that human being and giving him an insight into the relationships quantitative relationships of this world to the other world. And there are many examples of that in the tradition. So the second uh, realm, and I'm going to go into each one uh, more, is the period of life from birth to death. So the first one is the pre-worldly uh, realm. And this is called uh, the period Ahdul Mithaq, which I'll get into in a second. The Mithaq. The second is Dunya. Now, in Arabic, the word Dunya comes from a root word, uh, Dunya, and it has a few meanings. One of them is reaching out for grapes. That Will they, every time you, you get near them, they move a little further away from you. So it's the, the idea there is that the phenomenal world is that we, as we attempt to grasp it, we're moving away, right? Paul Simon has a song called Slip Sliding Away, right? The nearer you are to your destination, the more you're slip sliding away, right? And it's about death. Is that, you know, you're, and, and, and that, uh, that idea is captured in a wonderful hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in which he drew in the sand a box. And then he drew a line And he drew uh, a, a line up here. He didn't write it, but he drew a line here at the top of this line. And then he drew a line out here. And he said that this was a man's journey in life. And these lines were the arad. They were the vicissitudes of his journey. At each stage, things will happen to him. If they don't do him in, he moves to the next one. Until he reaches at this, the ajal is your appointed term. And it could be at any point because people are different. It could be at any point along the way. But there, for people who go all the way through, they reach old age, and what gets them is known as haram. And there's a tradition in which the Prophet said, peace be upon him, that the, the children of Adam, God has given them the ability to do all things except conquer haram. They can't conquer old age. And he also said that anxiety was half of haram, right? That having a lot of anxiety uh, will, will actually uh, cut your life in half. 
So, as you're moving up through life, you reach this ajal. But then he had a line outside of the box. And he said, this was a man's amal, which is his hope. So, a man's hope is always beyond his time. And it's, this is a really important motif. There's a verse in the Quran that says, Dharhum ya'kuru wa yatamatta'u wa yulhihim amaluhum. Leave them, these people that reject what you're telling them about the inevitability of the next life, leave them to eat and enjoy themselves and to be entertained and Yulhihim means to preoccupy themselves with their hope. And indeed they will come to know. In other words, their ajal will come and then they're going to realize that the ajal preceded the hope. And he also said that people, two things never grow old in people. Desire for life and desire for uh, more, right? In, and, and it means here, it doesn't mean all people, it means people that uh, are deluded. So the, this, this desire for extended life, and, and the interesting thing is the longer a person is here, the more accustomed they get. You know, you get up every morning, you have your rituals, your coffee, your breakfast, you go to work, you see the same people. Uh, you get accustomed to being here. And we, we get, uh, we, we're, we're, we're in this very interesting uh, experience of the permanence. And every once in a while there are things that happen that kind of shake us a little bit. Like one day you come to work and so and so was in an accident or so or you get a phone call and your mother just died or a good friend or something there are these reminders and they kind of shake people a little bit but most people brush themselves off and, and just go along get on with it right so we we have this really and this is all about this lower world the dunya because it's like the grapes, we're always reaching for it and it's always moving away. Because the moment we came into life, into this dunya realm, uh, our death, we're moving inevitably towards our death. One of my teachers in the desert when I was leaving, uh, and it was a camel journey of about a day, uh, the last thing he said to me, he said, this journey that you're taking this morning is like your life you're moving towards a destination and every step that your camel makes takes you a step closer to that destination. And he said every breath you take is a step closer to the termination of your breath. So keep that in mind along the way. And I was with a, a West African. We arrived at a, a, an airport and he'd never been on one of these uh, moving uh, not the, the escalators, but the actual sidewalks, yeah. And we got on it and we were standing there moving along and he said, this is amazing, this is just like our lives. We think we're standing still, but we're moving towards our deaths. <laughs> and then it was really interesting because at the end of the, uh, of the sidewalk there, there was a sign that said, uh, caution, the end comes abruptly. <laughs> So there's, that is the metaphor, right? <laughs> and this is the point that unlike that escalator where you know where it's going to end, the, 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 you know, this, this walkway of life that we're on, the end can come at any point. And so keeping this in mind is something that's really important. Now I'm going to go a little bit into that. And then the third uh, stage is known as the barzakh. 
And a barzakh is a space between two places. Like in the Quran it says about the two oceans, that between them is a barzakh. The, the sweet water and the salt water, between them is a, a, an interspace. And if, you, if you've ever seen where big rivers meet the ocean, there is an admixture of the sweet and the salty that has a completely different uh, ecology. It has a different, uh, the, the, the water is not the same. That is, that's what a barzakh is. It's an interspace that's not this or that. It's neither this nor that. And so when we die, there is a place that is neither this world nor is it the next world. You're in this interspace. And, and this is where people are in their graves. And, and we'll get to that also, inshallah. And then the fourth place is the gathering place where the hashar and the nashar takes place. And this is going to be final judgment. Uh, takes place in this realm. What's called the Day of Judgment. And then the fifth is the final abode. Either divine presence or alienation from divine presence. It's one or the other. Now, to look at the word uh, in Arabic for a life is called an Umar. And a Kuwaiti term of endearment, a wife will call her husband or the husband will call the wife Umri, my life. And if they're just getting to know each other, they'll say Ba'du Umri, part of my life. <laughs> So Omar is, a, it's not an entire life. It is a part of life. So for instance, in the Quran, it says that the Prophet is, uh, the Quran says to the Quraysh that the Prophet says to them, I dwelt among you a lifetime before this revelation. In other words, the first 40 years. So this is an Omar, right? The first 40 years is a lifetime. And some say there's a verse in the Quran that mentions that uh, God gave people a full life and it's said that it's 40 years. That if you've had 40 years on the earth, then you've had a full life. Right? And whatever comes after is just bounty. Right? That you should be grateful you made it to 40. So. Human beings within this dunya realm have stages also. And, and we'll get into that. So that's what an Umar is. It's a, it's a life. Now, the first life was the life before conception. And there's a verse in 7172 in, in your uh, translations, in the chapter 7172, when it says that when your Lord brought forth from the children of Adam from their loins their seed and made them testify of themselves, the Dhuriya, the all of Adam's progeny, every human being that would ever exist, was brought forth on a plane in this pre-worldly stage. And they were told by the in the divine presence, Alastu bi Rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? All, every soul that has ever existed, is existent now, and will ever exist, was brought into this divine presence and said, Am I not your Lord? And those souls replied in the affirmative, Bela shahidna, we indeed, you are our Lord, and we testify to that truth. Now this truth, is buried in the soul. And there's not a lot in the Quran or in the Hadith about this pre-worldly 
Uh, there's only one other event that we know of, which is another contract was made with the prophets that they would all tell their peoples of the last prophet. That's the only other indication that we have about this pre-worldly realm. Now, from this pre-worldly realm, there is a downward descent from this uh, divine presence the human being descends into the womb after a hundred and twenty days. At a hundred and twenty days, the, 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 this soul that was in the Divine Presence enters into the womb of its mother. So for the first hundred and twenty, we're dealing with a biological phenomenon that does not have spiritual life, right? It has biological life that is actually the mother, right? The biological life is the mother. The individuation of that soul does not come until 120 days. At 120 days, it enters into the womb and begins to experience and it's interesting because this is about the time mm -hmm. Does that bear upon abortion at all? Well, there were some scholars who felt that before 120 days abortion was permitted but the dominant opinion is it's not there, are, there, are, there is an opinion of scholars that abortion before 120 days was not, and it's not considered murder before 120 days, but it's considered prohibited by the vast majority of, of uh, the Muslim scholars uh, for a number of reasons. One, because it's an interruption of a divine process. Uh, two, because uh, there's a serious danger to the the woman, which it's not permissible to put yourself into a type of danger uh, for something. Because the Quran says, you know, Don't kill your children out of fear of provision. Uh, because uh, it says that children are provided for. They come with their own provision. That's a belief in Islam, that your children bring their own provision. Right? They, their food, everything they're going to get was already decreed for them. So you're not, you know, you're not, it's, they're not taking from you. They're actually bringing their own. And for most people, you know, they actually see an increase with children. You know, they'll, they'll, their lives actually, there's an increase that comes with children. Now, during this time, and it's interesting because about 120 days, the heartbeat, right, is audible. You'll start hearing the heartbeat. And during this time, the, the, the soul is in this, this is like a barzakh. Every death, out of these five stages, there is a death and a birth. So as you leave one realm and die from that realm, you're born into another realm. So we are, we are dying and being born into these realms. And during this time, it's, it's believed to be important for the woman to be in a good spiritual state. To, uh, and that these will affect the child, what she eats, making sure that her food is uh, halal. Also her thoughts, her state, and that's why in traditional cultures it was very important uh, that a woman was felt very secure, that there wasn't anxiety, that there wasn't, and this is why even with divorce, uh, the divorce period is the entire pregnancy, so that she doesn't have anxieties about uh, provision and things like that. And it's not encouraged to divorce uh, during pregnancy. Now. 
At the point that the child moves into the next stage from this barzakh, into the dunya, and that's why dunya means the lowest world. It is the lowest, we are in the lowest world, in this hierarchy of worlds. When the child comes into the dunya, the first thing that is done is the adhan is recited into the right ear. And the formula, which is known as the iqama, which is done before the prayer, is recited into the left ear. And then you put something sweet on the tongue. Dates, like chew some dates and put it on the tongue. And the reason for this is that there are two important things that every human being should know about the dunya. The first is the wa'ad and the second is the wa'id. The wa'ad is the promise that you will go back to the Divine Presence from whence you came. This is a promise. You will go back to the Divine Presence because the child is moving into the realm of separation. They're still in Divine Unity. And this is why children are not in a differential state. They can't differentiate at this point. What, what will happen is the, the promise is the garden. But the garden has a key. In other words, you, the garden is not earned, but it's also not given without struggle or effort. I mean, the Muslims confer with the Christians in that it is through grace that people are, uh, that people are, uh, are given the, the Divine Presence. But that grace is given through effort. In other words, there's nothing that you could do to make yourself worthy of that grace. So it's not something that can be achieved or earned. But at the same time, there has to be the move towards that. That it's not given without that effort. And that's why in the Qur'an you will see verses that indicate that this is a reward for what you are doing. It's, it's a reward that is, 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 is way beyond whatever the people were doing, but they don't get that without the effort. So the wa'id is, is this, the, the, when the child is born, it is the wa'id and not the wa'id because they're not in the realm of, of the, uh, the punishment. They're in the realm of the promise. And this is why children that die before puberty uh, have no accounting, according to the dominant opinion. And in fact, one of, well, I'll get to that when we, I might forget, so I'll mention this now. One of the things that ch people whose children die uh, before they reach puberty, on the day of judgment, they will bring water to their parents on the plane when everybody else is suffering. And, and then they'll actually be happy that that happened, like the pain they had in this world is transformed into a joy in the next world, and other people envy them. They're envious that they have those uh, children that come with this relief on that day. And they seek out their parents. They go and find them. So, the, the promise is what, is, what is told to the child is, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. This is a reminder to the soul that's embedded in this infant. It's a reminder. You see, you have this in many traditions. You know, the Platonic tradition talks about this. Plato believed that we, what this world was, was an arena to remember what we already knew in the world of archetypes. Before we came into this world, we knew truths. And this world, we enter into forgetfulness. And what we have to do in this world is wake up 
to what we already knew. And this is the allegory of the cave of realizing that there's a journey to be made. We have to get out of the, the shadow show, of the illusion, right? Which is really interesting because in a way, uh, human beings now, if you look at film and television, which are the dominant preoccupations of many, many human beings now, it's very similar to the cave. Because people are watching these images projected from lights flickering on their TV screens and in their movie theaters and their illusions. And there's this whole other real world out there. And there are people now that are preferring this world of illusion, this vicarious world, this virtual reality to a whole other world, which the world that they're dismissing is still considered to be another television. It's just a better program. <laughs> so that is the reminder to the soul. And there's a belief that the soul hears that. And it resonates. And there's a, there's a deep belief in the Islamic tradition that when people hear La ilaha illallah, that it resonates with them, that they recognize the truth of it. Mm -hmm. Just remind people of the meaning of what you're saying, what you're saying in Arabic. Right. I mean, everybody knows. Does anybody not know what La ilaha illallah means? Everybody knows that, right? La ilaha illallah. There's no God. But Allah, yeah, that's that is that is the, the the. I mean, from the Muslim perspective, that is the reason we were created to testify to that truth. That there's no other purpose. And Muhammad Rasulullah, which I mentioned, you know, earlier, is only the latest formula. There were Isa Rasul. Jesus is the messenger of Allah. Uh, Abraham is the messenger of Allah, possibly Buddha was the messenger of, of the truth, uh, Krishna, I don't know about, because they're not mentioned by name, but there are many traditional Muslim scholars that said that there are high probabilities that those traditions were prophetic traditions, uh, that, that came to their people with their language and their understanding, which is where you'll get uh, these differences. But the, the truth of la ilaha illallah, is something that souls recognize. And kufr is covering up that truth. That's, that's what uh, a, a person who is not in a state of submission is called a kafir, which is often translated as infidel, which is not a correct translation. Infidel is actually a Latin Christian term for people that didn't accept Christianity. Infidelis, without faith. The, the belief, the kafir, is somebody who's covering up this truth that its own soul knows because these lower passions have overwhelmed the higher essence of that human being and they don't like what the implications of that are. So they choose not to look at it. This is how the Muslims view it. Now, once the child enters into this realm, it will go through five stages. Mm -hmm. What is the wa'id? The wa'id is the warning that if you do not maintain your pre-worldly contract, which is that you testified to the truth of the Lordship of your Creator, that you, uh, you, you, you're, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Now, there is a belief in the Muslim tradition that if you have not been reminded, you're not taken to account for your forgetfulness. Right? Because the overriding mode of, of the Creator is mercy, it's not wrath. The Quran says the mercy has preceded the wrath. Right. And there's a tradition in which the Prophet ﷺ said that God has a hundred parts of mercy. 
99 he has retained in his presence and one part he has allowed to descend to the dunya. And it is that one part that a mother nurses her child with, that the, the, the mare raises her hoof from stepping on her foal. So every act of mercy in this world is only from that one part. And the 99 have been, uh, remain in the Divine Presence for the Day of Judgment. Now, the second stage is the stage of the lower world. So you have the womb, and then you have the childhood. Now, there's some interesting things before that just about the womb. There's many verses in the Quran, like 23, 12, and 4, uh, 22, verse 5, which deal with the phenomenon of the womb. And one of the, uh, there's a, a embryologist by the name of Keith Moore who wrote uh, one of the dominant textbooks for embryology. It's used, I don't know if it is now, but it was a few years ago at UCLA's medical school. Uh, and he wrote in, in the introduction that there was no embryological knowledge uh, before, I think it was maybe the 17th or 18th century, whatsoever. And there was no detailed knowledge until the 20th century with the advent of... of uh, a lot of the technology that's enabled us to look. I mean, now we've seen the miracle of life, right? You can watch the whole thing happen. And there's a Yemeni scholar, uh, Abdul Majid Zindani, who, who read this and, and wrote him a letter saying, you know, you're wrong, that in the seventh century there's very detailed embryological information. And Keith Moore actually uh, ended up going to Yemen and meeting with this man and being shown all of these verses and rewrote his introduction to his textbook. And there's some videos of his presentations about that in which he admitted that the detailed information in the Quran is the earliest uh, example of accurate uh, scientific information about uh, the embryological stages. And somebody asked him if it was possible for the Prophet to have known that, and he said that unless he had uh, uh, microscopic information and, and was able to go in and actually see these, because uh, it says in the 22.5, uh, Oh, humanity, if you're in doubt concerning this resurrection, then know that we created you from dust, and then from the drop of a seed, nutfa. Now, nutfa is a really interesting because these are not good uh, translations. Uh, nutfa, there is a verse in the Quran which says uh, that, that, that the man had a ta'ala lam yikun shay'an madhkura inna kharaqna l'insan min nutfatin amshaj. We created the human being from a nutfa, and then it says amshaj. This, in classical uh, Arabic exegesis, was always problematic because nutfa is a singular feminine form. And the adjective that's used to describe it is a plural. And you can't do that in Arabic grammar. So it was always considered problematic. But the word amshaj means, the, the, the message is this intermingling of lots of uh, things. So the idea is that we created you from this seed that has an intermingling of many things. Amshaj. And from that nutfa, we made you an alaqa. This is the next stage. The, the word in Arabic alaqa means a leech-like. Now what happens with the zygote when it's inseminated, 
right? It gets inseminated, the sperm goes up. And there's a very interesting hadith of the Prophet. And they asked him, how are males and females determined? Because the, 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 uh, the Arabs had a lot of superstitions about how, you know, there's, they still do this. Arab women will say, you know, uh, uh, lie on your left side or, you know, they've got all these funny things that they're supposed to do if they want a boy or a girl and, right? And, uh, and they actually believe positions influence that, sexual positions. <laughs> so he was asked how, what determines the male or the female? And he said, the female and the male water race. This is in Sahih Muslim. He said the female and the male water race. And the one that gets there first will determine whether the, uh, the child is a male or a female which is important for a number of reasons because women were often blamed uh, in classical Arabic tradition for having not producing males. It was considered something was wrong with the woman. Right? And so that indicates you know, the X and the Y chromosome that you have the male and the female water. And water is also used in the Quran in many verses uh, that are now interpreted to be the genetic material. We feed them all from the same water, but we vary them with that water. And ma means sperm as well in Arabic. Ma'ul insan, man's water is his sperm. So the, the alaqa means a clinging thing. So when the zygote comes down, it literally clings to the side of the womb and it will embed itself in the womb and actually will will break down to to cling into the womb so and then it begins the to derive its uh, nourishment from uh, the embryonic uh, sac and then it talks about being in the three veils of darkness uh, in the Quran which Keith Moore identified as these uh, the three layers within the womb and then it says, and then from a lump of flesh, it says mudra, and mudra is a chewed lump of flesh. And when the, when the if you see it on the, that, that first uh, period, it looks like a chewed morsel. It looks, if, if an Arab was told to describe what that was, he would say mudra. Even though it's still microscopic, it's a chewed lump of flesh. It looks like somebody, literally it looks like teeth marks where, where the, uh, where the uh, spinal cord is forming in that initial period, it looks like teeth marks. Somebody literally bit into it. And then it says, shapely and shapeless, because part of it has started to shape and other parts are still left unformed. So you can see this in, at the embryonic level, you can see that some of it is shaping and others still have no shape. And then it says that we may make it clear to you. That's why this is being told. In other words, it's saying if you're in doubt about what we're doing, look at this in order for it to be made clear to you. And, and we will, and then we cause what we will to remain in the wombs for an appointed time. So inside the womb, this, there is an ajal in the womb as well. So this is a life. There's an evolution that happens in the womb. And some of it will not reach its edge in the same way as this. There could be a spontaneous abortion. There could be an abortion uh, that's willed or an accident. So once the, uh, the, the child comes out, it comes into the next stage of dunya. So dunya has five stages. The first stage is one through, he says five, and there's another one that goes with seven, which is consistent with the Western tradition. You could either go one to seven or one to 15. If you go one to seven, which is also considered a classical Islamic uh, category. During these first seven years, it's the responsibility of the parents 
to nurture the child. This is a time that there is absolutely no responsibility, none. It's prohibited to, uh, to have any physical discipline during this time. Even up till 10, physical discipline is, is not permitted uh, in, 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 uh, in Sharia. Uh, other than uh, the scholars say it like twisting the ear, right? Um, grabbing the stomach, you know, pinching the stomach, giving them pinches. Any type of physical violent force is prohibited uh, in any situation, whether it's male, adult, female, adult, or child. is prohibited for any uh, violent physical abuse. That is haram in Sharia. Absolutely. And there's no proof or justification for it. And we're, we're going to look at the verse that a lot of people misunderstand, including, unfortunately, uh, some Muslims um, about that. But it's, it's well known in the uh, Islamic uh, Sharia that it is prohibited uh, to physically uh, strike uh, anyone with violence. Mm -hmm. Um, I just a question about the embryology. Was that from the Quran or the Hadith? No, that's Quran. That's Quran. Yeah, it's uh, there's several verses that deal with that actually, but the one I gave you was twenty two five. Now, in 22.5, uh, it continues and it says, Afterward, we bring you forth as infants. The word in Arabic, this stage is called the tifl. Now, tifl means, in Arabic, tufeli is a parasite. The tifl is somebody that cannot live on its own. It, it needs a host. So the child needs the parents. And this is the responsibility of the parents to nurture the child. Now, the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, said that every child is born on fitrah. And this is an important concept in Islam. Fitrah is the inherent nature of the human being. It's his aboriginal nature. It is believed in Islam that human beings are good in their nature. And it is, it is diseased societies that will uh, affect the, 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 the nature in a, in a diseased way. Now, this obviously does, is not congruous with the traditional Christian belief of the corrupt nature. But there is a similarity between the Islamic and the Christian belief in that there is a hadith that says that every child is born with a black seed in the heart. And this is similar but not the same as, as the understanding of original sin. How would you describe the, let's call it crack day, isn't it? Yeah, this is going to be uh, the, chil the actions of the parents affect their children. And there are, like in the Bible, the idea of visiting on seven generations, which is, you know, it's a lot. You're dealing with 64 parents. Uh, there is that concept in Islam, that your actions do affect your offspring. But there is no accountability of the offspring. In other words, nobody bears the burden of, you do not, like in some of the Chinese traditions, you have the idea of inherited curses. You know, that a family gets cursed for doing wrong in one generation and their offspring will suffer the fate of that curse. But there is a belief in Islam that, you, that righteousness will affect your offspring and also wrongs will affect your offspring. You don't, you don't think that it has anything to bear upon the, the concept of, of uh, inherent nature? Because a crank baby, in a sense, is a, starts out with a, an addiction. An addiction. Right. And the mother is responsible for that, not the baby. So the mother has, has affected the... And that's, we have that ability to completely destroy the fitrah. 
The, the parents can do that to the child. They can ruin it. I mean, that's what happens. Fitra is not, you know, children will not be... Uh, if, if they are nurtured properly... Now, there is a bad seed. There is a concept of bad seed in Islam. There's definitely a concept. In other words, there is a belief that there are shayateen al-ins, which are demonic uh, humans. And this results, uh, one, that demons will, will actually par partake in the insemination, that there's hadiths that indicate that people that are like in fornication, in, and it's interesting because Islam accepts marriage in every tradition. You know, even though it, it doesn't accept uh, the, the, the Buddhist as a people of the book, um, that, uh, you know, they're accepted as a, uh, as a tradition in that they can pay the, the, the jizya tax, according to Imam Malik, but their, their, their books are not accepted as uh, revealed books. They're not rejected, but they're not accepted. It's not in the Articles of Faith, like the, the Bible and the, the Gospel. But Buddhist marriage is accepted. If, if two Buddhists become Muslim, their marriage is valid. They don't have to renew that marriage because marriage is believed to be a divine institution. That it was through revelation that marriage came about. So marriage in any tradition is accepted. And therefore, children that are born of legitimate marriage in any tradition, uh, those children have the protection of the, the sanctity of the, of the union. Children born out of wedlock do not have that protection. And there can be effects on the children because of that. And one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ said is beware the wrath of bastard children. Beware the wrath of bastard children. That if you do that to children, they will be angry. And their wrath will come back to you. And he said, if illegitimacy spreads amongst a people, then they are spreading the wrath of God amongst themselves. And the wrath is in the children. Because that was a right that you have deprived them of. They have a right to legitimacy. And if you do not give them that, you have oppressed them. And oppression engenders anger. And they are often, they don't know why they're angry. Right? They don't know why they're angry, but they're angry. And, and for our country, when you're looking at 70% illegitimacy rates amongst uh, certain communities, right, and, and the dominant community, it's, it's, it's in the 40 percentile range, right? That, which a lot of you grew up in an age where, you know, Girls disappeared in high school, right? I mean, it's really amazing how much has changed in, in, in our generation, right? I mean, in, in 1968, a woman was kicked out of Vassar for living with a man in an apartment. 68. And it's, it's really interesting how, how that's happened in this culture. So this fitra nature is this inherent nature and it is that the potential for good and evil exists but the inclination is to, to good if it's nurtured. But the seed of evil can be nurtured also. And if that's done, then you get people that, that will, they're inclined to doing bad stuff, not good stuff. Mm -hmm. So I read it then and say in a Muslim country, are parents responsible for misdeeds of children? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there is no responsibility until puberty of the child. It all falls on the parents. After puberty, according to the hadith, the parents are taken to account in the next life, but not in this life. Once the child, you know, like if you've got chil uh, children that were raised brutalized, Right? By their father, you know, or a crack cocaine mother who doesn't do anything for a child, these type things. 
the responsibility, this is why you can't judge people in this world in any absolute sense. The prophet said, I was commanded to judge outwardly, but not inwardly. We, we do not have the authority to make inward judgments against people. We can only judge outwardly. And those outward judgments in Sharia are related to transgressions. But you cannot condemn people to hell. You can't, none of that. That's all inward judgment and we have no authority in that realm. The variables that are involved in any human action are so vast that no individual can grasp them. We can't. But responsibility is, lies on the adult. Once you reach adulthood, you are responsible. And in Sharia, it's not going to hold up in court to have a psychologist in there explaining what happened when they were children and why they're doing that. That does not hold up in, in, in Sharia court. Although, Sharia laws are often uh, contextualized in that a qadi might not decide to implement a, a had punishment, one of the, the penal punishments, because of contextual circumstances. That, that does exist. So there is that realm. It's, it's very uh, organic, the Islamic legal system. It's, it's not black and white at all. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the ages between 7 and 15, which is a huge uh, difference. Uh, do some communities or traditions do the 1 to 7 and the other 1 to 15? I'm looking at all of, you know, a lot of the crime is being committed by pre-15. Yeah, that's that in, in Sharia, if they're adult, they're responsible. Although, uh, this culture, by, by Islam, you cannot apply Islamic law in the United States. You can't. It would be completely unacceptable. Because Islamic law is organic. It's, it's, a, it's a holistic uh, system. You cannot have, so, like, let's chop off the hands of, uh, of thieves, and you have a consumer culture uh, where, where the whole society is, 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 is locked in to the, uh, the system of creating consumption as an addiction, right? I mean, you have to change. It's, it's you know, the, the Islamic uh, legal system, the first chapter of Islamic law books is called the chapter of purity. I mean, it, it, it's a spiritual tradition before it's a legal tradition. And so you can't, cannot impose the legal laws on a materialistic society. You have to introduce, and this is why the Meccan stage precedes the Medinan stage. The Meccan stage had no legal rulings. It was a stage of changing the perceptions of the people. And once that shift took place, this radical paradigm shift. Once that took place, then the rules begin to make sense. But to apply the rules without that would be injustice. Which is what, you know, this is the kind of conservative approach. Let's just make harsher laws. Right? See, the problem is the laws aren't harsh enough. Well, <laughs> you know, why are people doing what they're doing? And why is it that our, uh, our prisons, you know, are over 60%, uh, in fact, in most places, it's more like 75, 80% minority? You know, why is that? Well, that's more evidence, you know, that these are inferior type people. I mean, there's a lot of, that's an unspoken uh, belief amongst a lot of people in this country. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that are politically correct in their uh, public discourse, not in their private discourse. There's a lot of people that say, well, you know, these people, you know, they're different from us. They have different values, whatever, or no values. So whereas the Islamic situation is saying, look, what's going on, right? 
that th th these situations are being produced. What's engendering this? Because this is alien. You see, if you go to uh, black African, if you go to a Gambian village <laughs> where there's no crime, right? I mean, it's true or not true. And isn't it a large percentage of the African Americans in this country are from Senegambia, right? This, this is their genetic uh, inheritance. So why is it that a Gambian African uh, in his village is not uh, stealing, raping, and pillaging, right? And their 12-year-olds aren't going around doing gang banging. And yet, the same genetic bank in, uh, in the inner cities of, uh, of New York or, uh, right, or Chicago are doing that. You see, what's going on? Well, from the Islamic perspective, you have a diseased society. And therefore, you have symptomatic pathology. And the pathology is manifesting in children that are being raised in a disease-engendering culture. So, during these seven years, it's not encouraged to teach children either because they're learning. They have their own learning schedule. And in traditional cultures, you did not begin to train children until they reached seven, which is consistent also with the, um, the Waldorf, right? Rudolf Steiner felt back in the 20s that if we begin to educate children at the age of five, we are going to see precocious sexual development occurring. And the reason he said that is, is because you're dealing with a divine programming that's designed at, at if, you, if you bring programming that's not meant to be introduced earlier, then you're going to pull the whole process down. So instead of the sexual maturation occurring, like in this culture, when people who here might have grown up in the 50s, uh, at the age of 14, most boys and girls were not thinking about sexual experimentation, right? Really, they weren't. And you can talk to your parents if you're not that old, right? I mean, this is not, I'm not making this up. This is, even the menarche has, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the period now, it, we have early onset periods. We've got girls now at seven and eight that are beginning to menstruate in, in certain areas, right? So something's going on, right? Now, if you introduce, uh, it's actually considered damaging. Now, this is not true of all children. There will be because th you're going to have children that want to read at the age of three or four. But the vast majority of children are not going to be like that. And so they're doing their work between one and seven. They know exactly what they're supposed to be doing, and you let them do that. They're developing their, their minds, and, and they're actually they are, according to Islam and according to a lot of our neurological research, uh, it's confirming these ancient beliefs. Because this is not just Islam. This, this, this is congruous with many traditions. Seven was an age of initiation in many, many traditions. And in the uh, classical European oral culture before uh, Christianity literized that area, uh, seven was actually, you were an adult at seven. You went from childhood to adulthood at the age of seven because in oral cultures, seven-year-olds speak like adults. And you'll notice a radical change in the, uh, the ability of a, of a child to articulate at about the age of seven and eight. There, there's a real change in their ability to express themselves. And this is why even in England, uh, you know, in the eighth, ninth century, uh, seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds were being hung for uh, horse theft, right? Which, I mean, obviously that's uh, horrific, but it's indicative of an oral culture and how they view. And this is why you will find marriage occurred in oral cultures at early ages also. Uh, it was not uncommon in, in Europe, uh, Asia, the Middle East, Africa, for an eight- or a nine-year-old girl to be married. Not uncommon at all because they were considered to have already reached uh, the age of maturation in the oral understanding. 
So at the age of seven, they enter into what's called sinu tamiz, which is the age of discrimination. They can't now, they're beginning to understand certain, uh, certain things. Imam al-Ghazali said you can introduce to them now the concept of time in a real way. So they can understand things like uh, that they're in time creatures and also the responsibility of actions, although they're not fully responsible yet because they don't have all of the hard wiring yet. So this fitra, and it's in the chapter of, called the chapter of the Byzantines or the Europeans. Rome means Europe, it also means the Byzantines. It says that to set your face to the religion, <coughs> which is the religion of nature, the fitra given by God. And then it says, and do not change that nature, which is an indication that we can alter the fitra of people. And we have thousands of years of anthropological evidence that most cultures were benign cultures. I mean, we have a great deal of evidence. You know, we would like uh, those people who make weapons uh, would like us to believe that we are aggressive by nature. In other words, that by nature we like uh, to inflict violence and aggression. There are many uh, people that there's, there's a vested interest in having that. Uh, the truth is that most of the evidence that we have from Aboriginal cultures is, is contrary to that. Uh, the Shoshone Indians, you know, this is a good example of a culture that really rejected violence as a, uh, as, as an option, right? And there are many, many other, many African uh, cultures where th this is very clearly the case, that, that violence was seen as surgery, you know, that you did not use that route unless there was no other alternative. Uh, Whereas in our culture, it's, it's primary care, <laughs> right? It's lines in the sand. And anybody who knows Arab uh, psychology knows that you don't draw lines in the sand if you want to stay at the, the table of dialogue, right? If you want to reach some, and, and you know, it's, it, it's really, for, I don't want to get into politics, but uh, that, what happened in 1991 was an act of madness, complete act of madness. And we were, as a culture, collectively drawn into something that had nothing to do uh, with our vested interests, right? And, and unfortunately, it's still going on, but uh, Arab posturing is, anybody who knows the Arabs, is that they're people that posture. This is part of their nature. And uh, Saddam Hussein, you know, was, was literally doing a classic Arab posturing because uh, the uh, OPEC countries reneged on a promise that they made that they would help him with his war debts that uh, were incurred during the Iranian-Iraqi uh, war. And they reneged on it. And he put his troops there at the border as a, to force their hand. And they were told by our foreign policy here, you know, we're gonna stand behind you. Don't, you, know, you, you can stand up to him, right? And that was a very uh, easily, you know, a, a, not an intractable problem at all. But unfortunately, uh, there are people that have vested interests in using the violent option before uh, the diplomatic options, right? There's a lot of money to be made in war. Bechtel was already, was already before that war began, had contracts with the Kuwaiti government to rebuild their infrastructure, right? So, I mean, Thoreau said, an educated soldier is usually called a deserter. Right? If, if you really know what, what the fight is about, you know, sorry, count me out on this one, right? What a wonderful world it would be, they say, if somebody called a war and nobody showed up, right? 
And you know, the ancient peoples, when they used to fight, they had these war bonnets. If it rained, they'd call off the battle. <laughs> and, and they used to do, you know, the Prophet Muhammad is seen as, as this, in the West as this violent person. Over, over 23 years, less than 1,200 people were killed in all of the engagements that took place. Less than 1,200. It's recorded every battle how many people died. And they actually preferred to have, you know, the heroes would go out and they'd duke it out and then they'd, you win and they'd all go home, right? And that's, I mean, would that that'd be a great way, right? Let, let uh, it's like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Lindbergh said, uh, the America first during World War II, he said it's not their sons that are going to die in this war, right? The warmongers, they never send their sons. Right? And that's why the Iroquois nation, in the Iroquois nation, it was the women that were the war council. The women decided whether the nation would go to war with another tribe with the belief that it, it was the women who sent their sons to die. Right? And there's the great uh, Greek play. Yeah, thank you. About the women all going on strike. <laughs> okay, fine.